you've had a rough few years. I just figure I was <laughs> something I did in a previous life or something. I'm paying for it this time. <laughs> I don't know. I if, if you know, I can't really think that deeper. I'd uh, I wouldn't I have to be strong for this has been going on almost four years. A lot of preliminary trials that I've sat through and a lot of wow. evidence I've seen and heard that has never been made public and it's brutal. So I have to stay strong for my son. Who was Adam? Adam was the most kindest, gentle, biggest heart very compassionate, uh, honest, and he could not get away with anything. Hmm. He, he just couldn't. He would tell on himself. And uh, he just uh, he had, a, he had a really good soul. And then um, he got into drugs. And he'd get clean, and you know he'd straighten out for a while, and he'd, you know, it was, he'd be, a, but then all of a sudden he would just go missing for a couple of weeks, and I knew, and he'd be dabbling again, and he didn't show up for work, so he'd lose that job, and then, you know, he did, uh, he was great at tattooing, like at 17 he moved up to Wasaga Beach and worked all summer hmm. and that's when he, I, he found drugs and I didn't, uh, I, didn't, I didn't understand it and didn't actually realize it till he came home and told me mm -hmm. but he was gone all summer. No it wasn't 17 it was 18. Yeah. What drugs was he into? Um, at the time, I don't know, but near the end, it was crystal meth. And him and his girlfriend both had a bad addiction. And then he was trying to get off of it, and he was going to the methadone clinic, and he was going to, because he was always getting in trouble for, like, um, stealing mm. to feed his habit. Mm. And, um, you know, so three times I bailed him out of jail and the fourth time uh, the judge refused him bail and um, you know, it was uh, but he was he was on and off drugs for probably 10 years the last time he was denied bail, was that how he ended up at UMDC? Yes. Uh, I went to the bail hearing Tuesday, waited all day, they didn't bring him up. Went Wednesday, waited all day, they didn't bring him up. Went Thursday, when they finally brought him up into the prisoner's box. I gasped, like, I was in shock, and the whole, there was probably about 30 other people waiting with, for other pet trials, or bails, and they gasped, and he was beaten so badly I didn't recognize him. You did not want him to stay in jail? No, especially, and uh, the judge at one point said to me, what do you see over there? And I said, I might see my son who's been beaten beyond recognition. She said, I see a drug addict. He can get beaten in jail, he can get beaten on the streets. I said, you can't run in jail. And uh, I was probably on the stand about 45 minutes. And then in the end, she denied him bail. And they sent him to EMDC, where he, where I would go visit him. And How long was he serving? When he died, he had 47 days left. And this, so it would have been June, almost six months. And 
uh, he went cold turkey in jail. He called me two, three times a week to collect. He, um, and what was the charge he was in for this time? He used somebody else's ID, possibly a credit card. Okay. To purchase five cell phones. Okay. He then put them on, I don't know, maybe Kijiji. Okay. And then he was dumb enough to go back mm. and try it again, and he was recognized. Mm. And then the police put a warrant out for his arrest for, I think, fraud, identity fraud, something like that. Just, it just, that's what he did. It was totally wrong what he did. Um, but it was to feed his drug habit, which is not an excuse, but why, but why he did it. So then uh, he was, he met Jim Henderson in uh, EMDC, and he works for the Mission House and Quinn Warner, which is a long-term drug rehabilitation. And. Uh, his last phone call was uh, the 31st, the night he died, and I hadn't heard from him in three weeks, and he called about 6.20. And I was like, he's like, hey mama, and I was like, hey Adam, I said, what's going on? I haven't heard from you in so long. He goes, oh, he goes, we've been on lockdown, and you could just hear so much commotion in the back. He said, nobody's been allowed to use anything. He says, just wanted to phone you and tell you I love you. He goes, and in 47 days, I'm coming home. I'll be home on the 16th, the day before Paige's birthday. We're going to celebrate, and then I'm going into treatment for a month, and then I'm going to long-term. He says, I can't wait, and he was so excited, and then he was, there was yelling in the back, and he's like, Mama, I love you. i got to go. Somebody else needs a phone, and we're going to be locked down again, and that was the last I heard from him, and he was so excited in all his letters, you know. He, and phone calls prior to that, he was always talking about, like he was sick for three weeks in a cell, detoxing with nothing. And, you know, and. Because of withdrawals. Yep, and withdrawals. So, and you know, he, he did it. And because he was there, he couldn't, he did, he, he then wanted to stay clean. Mm -hmm. um, the police took all of my letters um, for their investigation. I don't get any of them back until after all trials are done, including mm. appeals. Mm. Um, no, I do get them back before the appeals because now it's all been entered into evidence. I found one letter that I had put in my top drawer in my dresser. So I did find it and I do have it. And it's uh, dated September 12th. 2013, which is approximately six weeks before, and he was. I reread it again last night. It's uh. I believed him, you know, and the toxicology. Um, came back from. His autopsy, and there was absolutely nothing in his system, not even the. A jail brew, nothing. He didn't drink. He'd have the odd glass of wine with me because I like wine, but he didn't. He wasn't. So. What happened the night that Adam was killed? From what you understand. From what I understand, he had asked a couple times to be moved to the empty cell beside him. Um, there was an empty cell beside him? Yes. And uh, he had already taken all his stuff out of that cell and eaten with an, in a, a different cell with another guy, but he went back into that cell. Um, for whatever reason, Anthony George was sent to from Sarnia jail to London jail. In Sarnia, he was segregated. So 
Um, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing because Sarnia says they sent the paperwork. Yeah. London says they didn't get it. Mm. He wasn't supposed to be in general population. He's already beaten a f quite a few men. Mm. So um, Adam didn't tell me, but he did because he didn't, I guess he didn't want me to be in pain, but he told Amy that Anthony George was always, he was waking up with Anthony George shaking, choking him into unconsciousness. And apparently he had done it quite a few times on the range. And um, the guard's response was that it's just horseplay. When I understand the beating went on for about 20 minutes with Adam begging for his life, begging, begging for them to key up, to help him. Uh, to move him. For the guards to help him. And when you beg, key up, that means you have to unlock the, uh, the cell. So he was screaming that? Screaming, yelling, begging. Um, no one heard him? Everybody heard him. Um, other inmates were yelling, help Adam, please help Adam. Um, uh, inmate on the level below said to the guard, he's beaten, that somebody's getting beat, somebody's getting murdered up there. And they ignored him. And uh, apparently uh, at one point, Anthony George made him clean up all his own blood and then proceeded to beat him to death. Um, and then uh, they're supposed to do uh, duster rounds every 20 minutes, half hour. It's not half hour. Uh, in the guards' preliminary trial. It was proven that they falsified the duster rounds. After the fact, there's no way you went in and did dust arounds and not seen the blood and a body for, apparently he was dead by between, murdered between 8.30 and 9 at night. And, uh, there's inmates that, uh, are having, uh, have, is it post-traumatic stress? And because that's all they dream about is watching, hearing, and nobody helping. And I, um, I've seen in the preliminaries horrific, horrific, evidence, uh, video. Um, I've seen where his bloodied sheep body is being dragged to the showers. What are the guards doing? No one notices. Nobody. Then uh, you see the blood being mopped up. The guards are doing nothing. They don't notice again. Again. I've seen. How long was he dead for before a guard finds out? Almost 12 hours. It was apparently approximately 8.30 in the morning. And he was beaten beyond recognition. They didn't know who it was in the shower. Um, we were allowed to view him before he was cremated. Um, Cameron McCormick, the funeral home, he was a very nice man. He, he did his best, uh, but basically um, all we got to see was his two hands and we were asked not to move them and uh, his face was covered with a velvet uh, thick cloth and uh, he had 
fully covered if uh, you couldn't see his, anything, couldn't see his face. What do you understand why, why that was the case? Probably because there was so much damage. And there probably wasn't much of a face left. So I probably would not have believed it was my son except that uh, this hand had a red skull side view, just the outline tattoo, not colored in. And um, then I knew it was him, but I didn't want. Uh, but yeah, my other son and my sister have uh, viewed the photos from I believe the autopsy like of his face in that mm -hmm. as they had them there uh, there was a few times I did have to leave the courtroom because uh, I was gonna get sick I couldn't see them I for the trial I will not leave the courtroom I don't want to see them, but I will stay um, but yeah he's um, there's a there's no reason that that wasn't stopped or that he wasn't found for almost twelve hours. No, nobody can give me a reason. How did you learn that Adam had died? Well, I took my husband and my, my, I took my daughter to college in the morning, I took my husband to work, and I went over the river. And I got some groceries and gas and, you know, and timed it to pick my daughter up at 2.30 from college and my husband at 3 from work. And this is October 31st or? Yeah, November 1st. November 1st, okay. And I backed in so that my husband could unload all the groceries and me and Paige were in the house. Your daughter. My daughter. And uh, Kenny was still in his work uniform. He said, uh, there's three people at the door. And I could see through the, some of it's stained glass and some of it's clear. There was suits. And Paige's like, who are they? I thought it was just Jehovah's Witness. I said, don't worry, Kenny's gonna go outside and tell him to go away. And then Paige says, dude, we don't use our front door, so you have to use our side door. And she goes, did Jehovah's Witness normally come down your driveway if you ask them to go away? I said, no. And then I opened the side door and I looked at Kenny and looked at his face. And I looked at the three people behind him. And I said, was he beaten to death? And they said, do you already know? I said, no, no, no. He said, why are you here? Because I could see the badge. I said, was he beaten to death? And they're like, you haven't heard anything? I said, I've been in the States for three hours. No, I haven't heard anything. Well, why do you think he was beaten? I said, because he was beaten beyond recognition in Sarnia. They sent him to London for his safety. I said, and I know he was scared of his cellmate. And they came in and I basically just slid down the wall and sat on the floor and it was two males and a female I think was more for, um, I wouldn't say victim services, but she was more- Family support. Yes, mm -hmm. family support. So then I said to Paige, I said, um, Call daddy at work. 
And they said, Kenny, because they hadn't told me yet. I said, call mom. I said, call my mom and Marty to come over. And then, then they did tell me that he was found in the, sh in the stalls and um, that yes, he had been uh, beaten to death. And I didn't know, I just, my, my heart. So I basically had 24 hours of bliss And then, and then your world collapsed. Back into hell again, and then another black cloud. The day that they came to your house to tell you, do you recall what was going through your mind? Uh, once I started to get my wits about me, I was like, I gotta go. And they were like, where are you going? I said, I gotta go, I gotta go. I, I gotta go find Shane in London. I gotta go tell him he can't hear this on the news. He can't hear this on the radio. Shane is my son. He Your lives son. in London. Your other son. Lives in London. And uh, my husband and my ex-husband each put their arms around me and they said, no, no, Dan, but you can't drive. And then the officer, or detective, because they were in suits, they weren't in uniform, said, we have somebody looking for him to tell him you you're you're not driving us to London. I was like, okay, okay. And then uh, Shane was on the bus because he does he, he doesn't drive in London. It's not worth the parking is retarded. And he got a a police a call from the police. And he said, no, I'm on my way home. And he was trying to figure out, you know, what he did wrong. Or so him and Lakin, his fiance, got, and they told him. And then probably about 20 minutes later, my phone rang, and it was Shane. And he was just like, Mom, Mom. And then I was bawling, and he was bawling. And, and uh, it was a Friday. He said, I, I can't get there today. He goes, I'll be there tomorrow, because he usually takes the train, and uh, so he came. My sister came from Windsor, my brother came from Sudbury, and uh, they didn't, uh, they didn't release Adam's body for four days. Why? I, I don't know. I guess because of um, the autopsy. Um, some of his brain was sent to forensic sciences. Um, this, I think it was just more of an intense autopsy mm -hmm. because it was where it happened, I guess, mm -hmm. in jail. Were you angry? Were you confused? What are you feeling at that moment? Pain. Just pain. Pain for him that he had to endure that. I would have taken that. I would have taken that. Don't do that to my son. I've never spanked my children. Who gives you the right to hit them? He never fought. I've never fought. Verbally, yes. I could stand my ground. He didn't even do that. He would just walk away. What do you understand about Anthony George? That <laughs> that he's a. My opinion, he's a coward, a bully, picks on little people, beats up little people to show that he's tough. 
I don't think he should ever get out of jail again. I think he's a dangerous offender. He does it in jail. He'll do it on the streets. He does. It, he has done it on the streets. And that's one thing the autopsy told us is that if Adam had survived, he would have been a vegetable for life. I wonder where you place the blame. On the system. Absolutely no communication from the Sarnia Jail to the London Jail. Anthony George should have been sent straight to segregation like he was in Sarnia. Um, starting with the judge, Judge Dale. Jail doesn't give them the opportunity to rehabilitate. There's no services in there. You know, the reason he was doing crimes was to feed his drug habit. You need to address that. Not say you're not learning from your mistakes. No, he wasn't. But nobody would. There's, especially in Sarnia, there is no rehab. Mm. And every rehab that you contact, you need to detox 10 days before you go in. Well, there is no detox here. There's nothing, you know? And I, I read in the paper that the Sarnia, Windsor, London, like, is one of the highest for drug use. And they, you know, nothing's being done to, if somebody wants to get off it and if somebody wants to make themselves healthy again. The solution isn't to, you, know, you get six months in jail and a record. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a solution. They wouldn't even release him to me under house arrest because that's the one of the things the prosecutor said, well, how are you going to keep him there? I said, I'll sit on his head. I said, I look at him. He's been beaten. didn't matter. Do you think he was an easy target in prison? I don't know if he was an easy target. He was just, he was, he had a cellmate that shouldn't have been in that range. And he was very, Adam was very likable, very likable. Get along with everybody. You know, and that's some of the there's quite a few inmates that testified at the preliminaries and they all like thought of him like a little brother you know so I don't think he was a target I think whoever would have been in that cell was a target just so Anthony could, George could prove how tough he was to the to the range how long were they cellmates for I think maybe just over a week or so. But even when we went to Anthony George preliminary and I was in the front row and his arrogance, he sat there looking at me going like this. I had to leave because I was going to throw up and I was like, and the judge didn't even tell him to stop it. How are you holding up? I'm holding up for him. You know, I just... I want justice for Adam, but I want things to change so that, that, that there isn't another Adam. You know, if someone is habitually beating people or bullying people, you know, those guards get paid a lot of money. Do your job. You're going to pass the buck. Well, management doesn't, so we don't have to. Well, then maybe y'all need to be fired and or retrained or bring in people who want to do the job. No, it's probably not a great job. But what real job is great? All jobs have perks. All jobs have 
downsides. But do your job. Communicate like they sh he should never. Anthony George, if it's in segregation in Sarnia, should have been in segregation in London. It would never have happened. So whoever would have been in that cell, whether it's my son or somebody else's son, was going to get beaten to death. Or at least beaten badly enough. What do you make of the fact that this is happening not like in a hidden corner, but in a in a in a jail with guards and cameras, and nobody hears him, nobody intervenes. Nobody. What do you make of that? They're not doing their jobs. Sitting and watching my monitor, sitting on your cell phone. What are you doing? Oh, it's lunchtime again. We're in the snack room. If the whole range is yelling and people below, cement floor below, can hear, you just turned a deaf ear. That's what they did. They didn't do their job. I don't, there's no excuse. I don't know how they sleep at night. I know I don't. I have nightmares. No. About what? About what my son went through. The beating. I wake up in a sweat. Terrified. Terrified for him. You said you want to see change. What specifically do you think needs to change? I think starting from the top. You know, like they can do an inquest like they just did and rehire three guards because they, you can't blame them for not doing their jobs. The management doesn't do their jobs. Well. What are you gonna do to change that? There's your inquest. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna retrain your staff? Are you gonna bring out the procedure book that everybody can't remember if they have one and go over it and over it? Hire, new, hire more staff, because that's why they were always on lockdown, short-staffed. Like, some of them make it's the Queen's List. They make over $100,000. Police officers don't make $100,000. You make that much money, do your job. If you don't know your job, learn it. And your job is to protect the inmates from each other. I believe that's part of your job. That's my belief. What do you think that um, the officers, the guards would say their priority is when they're there? Is it to protect the inmates? Is it to protect themselves? Is it to protect their, their co-workers? How do you think they see their job? Just putting in time. Clock in, clock out. Do, what it, do the least amount that I have to do. Duster rounds weren't done. Checks weren't done. And what did you do for 12 hours? When they were all the yelling, they just shut the door. So it was less loud. Didn't go in and check. Didn't ask, you know, if you're kind of a little bit worried, even though they're all locked into a cell. Okay, didn't bother to get another guard with him didn't do anything. You got bars between you and the inmates. All you had to do was go take a walk around, see what's going on. You didn't. Do you think a place like that can ever be safe? Jail? Or do you think this is just part of the fact that you have 
inmates from different walks of life who are in unfortunate circumstances. I think if they're properly staffed and they're not double the capacity of what they're built for, then yes, it can be maintained and done well, properly, not well, but properly. You know, because that's their findings. We have double the capacity and short staffed. Well, the government runs this. The government's responsible. You know, recruit, train the new ones. Mm -hmm. They have put an addition at EMDC now, but that's, I believe it was, I read it was for short term. Yeah, that's for the weekend people, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's still overpopulated over and it's understaffed. So those are the first two things you have to fix. I've heard that there's still instances where people are being put with each other without a care for what are they in for? So people who are in for violent crimes continue to be put in with people who are in for theft, minor theft or fraud. Yeah. What do you make of that? That nothing changed after your son's death. That's what one of the guards told us. Yeah. Oh. See that they didn't. They're. But I. I guess they. They don't take his death seriously to enough to make changes. You know, I guess there's just no care factor. Did you ever get an apology? No. no. From anyone? No. The ministry? The no. Nope. Guards? No. Nope. No, actually I was uh, verbally abused at the by the guards and their union reps at the preliminary trials. Saying what? Uh, that I was the reason my son was dead. How so? I was going to the bathroom. And as I was pushing the door open, she was on the bench with uh, two other officers or guards, I should say. And as I pushed the door open, I heard, you're the reason your son's dead. And my stomach, I turned around and I said, what did you say to me? And she was sitting. And she just stared at me. And I yelled, you coward. What did you say to me? She said, look at you. You're the reason your son's dead. I said, no, you are. You asked for a trick on trick or treat. It was, and Anthony George choked Adam out, and that started it. I said, "You're the reason." And then I was upset and I was yelling. And I, my husband come around. He found his way. I was now crying. Uh, he took me downstairs to victim services. And I wrote everything out that happened. Uh, police officers went up and escorted her downstairs so that I could go back upstairs. And then they brought her in. She did her testimony. I stayed out of the courtroom and then she left. So as you know, there was an investigation and as a result of um, what happened to Adam, six of the guards lost their jobs right. and appealed. Yes. What do you make of that process? Well, I, the result was three of them got the jobs back because it's not their fault. They don't do their jobs because management doesn't do their job. That was essentially their defense that, yeah. you know what, this is how EMDC has been running for a long time, so we shouldn't lose our job because nobody else does it too. So we can't be held responsible. And to a certain extent, the arbiter agreed with that assessment. Mm -hmm. 
Well, then they should change it, shouldn't they? But how did that make you feel? I wasn't surprised. Hmm. Wasn't. Hmm. Yeah. Same with. You knew that policies at EMDC weren't followed. No, I didn't. I didn't know until all this happened. No, I no, I'm not. I've never even had a parking ticket. I don't know anything about the jail systems. I just have no faith, so I wasn't surprised. I have no faith in the system. I have no faith in the government improving the system. I have no. It's there's nothing I can do about it. That's how you feel. Yeah. Is this after Adam or before that as well that you felt that way? I never had a thought about the jail system before Adam, so like it would be after. It's if I feel like the only person fighting for my son is me. Of course, I have a great support system, so I'm not alone. You know, I have my family and my husband and my ex-husband and his family. But it's just like banging your head against the wall. Nobody cares. They pass the buck. You know? Mm -hmm. They just keep, you know? So if you keep passing it and it just keeps going up, well, why doesn't somebody up here start making changes, little ripple effects? They don't, they're not going to happen overnight. Absolutely not. But you got to start somewhere so it doesn't happen again. You know, like you, as simple as you said, they're still housing a dangerous offender with a, a shoplifter. You know, that's great. That's a simple solution to fix immediately. That doesn't even take training. It, it requires reading as to reading what the charges are and saying, okay, this goes to this range. He goes to that range. That's just like, it's a pretty easy step to start. I wonder how you process the reality that he was so close to being out. It's just, it's hard to, you know, and what I process, I guess, is he never got a chance to prove everything he had promised me, you know, I mean. That he was going to stop doing drugs. And he wanted to get better. And I told him, I said, you know, I said, you might not be able to come back to Cernia for a while, like you have to stay away from that crowd so he never got to prove himself um, be successful at that um, I, would you like me to read my last letter or set no I got a letter the day he died but he, I'd get two or three. Absolutely. It's September 12th, 2013. That's when he wrote it. That's when he wrote it. When did you get it? Do you remember? I would have got it probably within three days from London. Uh, he was, he was then that September 12th, so when he was murdered approximately six weeks later. Dear Mom, I just wanted to write to express my honest to God gratitude for all your support in all this. I know dealing with my court days, taking off work, tiring days spent waiting hours at the court for my 10 minute appearance is stress enough for anyone, but your constant battle to get me rehab, standing behind me and going to bat for conditional sentencing, calling my lawyer and probation to secure it, allowing me house arrest if granted to be served out at your house and the strain it may have caused to have it happen I promise isn't and will not be lost on me. 
my heart and soul are filled with love to know I have such support and I will get and stay sober no matter what happens in court on Thursday. You will never see me high again nor hear a lie past my lips. I'm done with stories or not facing my problems. You've shown me love no matter the situation so I have no reason to lie and cover who I am or who I was. I am going to seek counseling upon my release no matter what. I'm going to be the best person I can be, the kind, loving person I was as a child. That's who I really am. I don't care who knows it, and I'm done being fake. I have everything I need in family. Love, Adam. So, there's a big reason as to why I believed him. Because if I don't believe him, and I don't support him, who will? I don't want to give him that chance, and he didn't get that chance. And I don't think he wanted to hurt me anymore. He was hurting himself. You know, and he, he had to be off drugs, which he did in, in jail, to see what he's doing to himself, his life, his family. When you read that, what do you think? I'm so proud of you. Nobody could say that but you. I can't tell you what to say. I can't make you go to rehab. I can't make you do anything. You have to want to do it for you. And you finally did. You didn't get a chance. I would rather you got a chance and proved me wrong. But we'll never know. I don't think he would have proved me wrong. Or, or proved anybody else wrong. I, I believed in him. Let's talk a little bit more about Adam. How old was he when this happened? 29. What was he like as a kid? Always adventurous. Like, climbs, climbs on top of the garage roof, falls off, breaks his arm. <laughs> Broke his wrist. He cracked his wrist. Uh, they went on um, grade six. They went to Boulder Mountain. Class trip. Skiing, snowboarding. On his first run down, he wiped out. He cracked his wrist. He didn't say anything all day to the teacher because he didn't want the class to have to end their day. He told her when he got back on the bus. You know, he was, uh, oh, I would say right up until about grade four, there wasn't a class picture that he didn't have a scab on his face from wiping out, <laughs> falling. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there was chin or his nose cheek <laughs> you look at his childhood pictures you're like really um, he was in grade two uh, the bell went after lunch and he went running he wiped out lost his front tooth right in the ice <laughs> just you know but everybody liked him everybody you know he lost his uncle Mike um, in November and uh, his Aunt Irene couldn't he was 11 couldn't face Christmas there's he has three cousins and uh, I don't know where he got the money but he on Christmas Day sat beside Irene and presented her with a rose in a handwritten letter about Uncle Mike. And she was able to sit at the da table with us. Like he had a compassion. You know, what, was, what were his dreams? Oh, grand. <laughs> a lot of pipe dreams. I was like, 
Like what? Opening his own tattoo shop. I'm like, okay, that takes a lot of money. Um, you know, he just, he, he was always going to do something. But it was, I was like, okay, a little bit back to reality, Adam. <laughs> you know? But no, he just had, sometimes you just shake your head at him because you're just like, really? Where'd you get that from? Like what? Going up to Wasaga Beach and opening his own place and, you know, and then going to open a place in Sarnia and, and just, it was like, you know, the thousands and thousands of dollars. When he uh, did, he asked me, Amy to marry him when they were living. He had, they had moved to Niagara Falls and he was tattooing at uh, Lucky 13 there. And he asked Amy to marry him. And he called me and asked me to be his best man. They never did get married. That was really interesting. I was like, oh, okay. Um, Do you have a lot of happy memories of Adam? Oh, yeah. 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 He, uh, he was about two. And on the counter, I had just peeled an onion. And I went to get something out of the fridge, and I come back, and he had taken a big bite out of it. He thought it was an apple. He, he, he had tears running down his face. <laughs> and I was telling him, just spit it out. <laughs> but yeah, he was, he was just, he was happy-go-lucky. Him and his brother would spend hours playing Nintendo. And I would, I'd had Paige, and I would just put her in a little bouncy chair, and we'd give her just she'd sit there and she'd just watch watching all the stuff going right and then I could go make supper I could go clean something <laughs> how would you describe EMDC dysfunctional have you been inside since or no I the only time I was ever there was just in the visiting area where they come they're on this side and you're on this side with a phone to talk through. But that's what, that's what it's it. What would you and Adam talk about in those visits? It would just, you know, start out, how was the drive? Thank you, come to see me. Um, can you bring, me, bring Amy on, you know, like, say, two days? I think you're only allowed three visits a week. And... So then I would bring Amy and I would just stay in the Jeep and I'd say, yeah. And then he would just talk about how he passes his day and how he goes out and he's trying to get in the kitchen so that he can make your day go quick and just talk about whatever he wanted to talk about. Just Did he complain about EMDC at all? Not to me. Everything's good, Mama. So he called me Mama Dukes. Um, no, but Amy told me after that he, had, because she didn't have a landline, so he would call me, and then he'd say, same thing, can you, can you tell Amy to be here tomorrow at 5? So then she would come to my house, he would call collect, and then she'd go in the bathroom and shut the door for privacy and use the phone. And I'd usually just go outside. I don't, I don't want to eavesdrop. It's not my. It's their conversation. And uh, but she did tell me after that he had told her that Anthony George was choking him into unconsciousness, and that he was waking up with him on top of him choking him and asked if he moved because you know, I hadn't heard from him for three weeks and I was I was getting anxious and worried, right? Yeah. Just not worried. I wasn't thinking anything bad. I was just like, it's mm -hmm. been a long time. Because you know? one time he didn't call for a week. 
And they said, I haven't heard from you all week. Are you okay? He's like, well, this has got to be costing you a lot of money. So they're just trying to save you on your phone bill. I said, don't worry about my phone bill. I said, we'll figure it out. It'll get paid. I just, I need to hear your voice. And then about three weeks was, was the longest. And it was really ironic that it was that night in 620. And ironically, again, is Halloween is his favorite time of year. Mm. Loved Halloween. And we'd always, I'd dress up when I took him out trick or treating. As a kid? Mm -hmm. We all three would. I'd be dressed up. I'd follow you know, about half a block behind while they did their running. And then their bags would get heavy and I'd carry them while I had new bags. <laughs> you know, I understand that a lot of the evidence was captured on video. Yes. Did that help you or did that make it just more difficult? Oh, no. It's, it's um, Hearing it one, is one thing, but to see it? Uh, it's very heart wrenching. It's very just makes you even question more. Why? Why wasn't some? Why wasn't it stopped? And you know, there's and there's not. It's not audio. It's just video. But it's still you can see. What do you see? Um, like his body being dragged you can see commotion in the time frame it was happening of the other inmates like they go the cameras don't look in directly there's mm -hmm. but you can see angles right mm -hmm. like there's n there's no excuse for the guard to have not seen commotion heard a lot of commotion a lot of yelling and screaming and begging, begging. That's what bothers me the most is that he was begging for his life, begging. And other inmates were begging, help Adam, please, please help Adam. I understand there was a settlement. Did that help in any way get closer for you? Oh, it was. It was peanuts. It was a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. It also um, was basically the only offer, basically attitude was take it or leave it. And the only person responsible for Adam's death is Anthony George. Not us, not the guards, not the government. That's what they made you sign, essentially. That was it. That was basically it. Yeah. Like. And it wasn't about money. I would I would have held out for years because I wanted the government to acknowledge that their employees, the guards, did not do their job. And they still refused to. It was just basically like a token, go away, just go away. It absolves the government the employees, the guards of any wrongdoing. It only holds Anthony George responsible. Why do you think that was the case? I have no idea. Yeah, I can't wrap my head around how the government works issue or any or obviously conducts anything. And I actually didn't know until after the fact that it absolved everybody. Can you possibly explain what the last four years have been like for you? A nightmare, continually, continually driving an hour and a half to London, sitting through evidence and then having to drive home. My husband's legally blind. He doesn't drive. And sometimes I'm in a fog and I still got to drive home. And then I got to get back up and drive there again. 
Um, it's been spread over where the most amount of time that I had, I would say off from it, was seven months where I could start thinking about what happened, um, start getting a little bit of a routine at home. Mm -hmm. um, I've not allowed my daughter to go because I don't want her scarred for life. Um, I can barely sit through it and watch it, hear it. She. Uh, But yeah, it's just been, you know, like it was a week and a half. I got a week and a half notice that on that they had set aside set up aside two days. Anthony George's lawyer was um, going for a change of venue, so I had like ten days notice and back to court for two more days. Um, I got a week's notice that the guards were pleading the B, what is it, what's that new law, 11B or B? That they didn't get their trial in time. Right. I was going to ask you about that. So and so, like, I, it's just nonstop. My phone, when my phone rings, no caller ID, my stomach sinks. because it's victim services who are amazing, but they're relaying and giving me information. And then, you, you, you know, my husband has to call work. He can't, he's got to get the day off. My mom and my stepfather go. My sister drives from Windsor. She takes the day off. It's like, yeah, it's, you know, then I'm, uh, my daughter doesn't drive. So I'm making arrangements to get her to work. Mm. Like it, yeah. It's just it's it's nonstop. I was going to ask you, how has this all affected your family? Surprisingly, it has made me and my husband even stronger. It did the opposite for my son and his fiance. They broke up. My daughter's, because I've, I've uh, protected her, is strong. It, it, it's hard on my, my parents, like my mom and stepdad. They're in their seventies, and I always think they're going to have a heart attack in court. Um. It's it's a huge financial burden, the amount of gas and like my sister mm -hmm. driving from Windsor to London, taking time off work, she's losing money. Like it's just it's it's not a lot of big things, it's just a bunch of little things. And it's yeah, it it affects, you know? And If it wasn't for the strength and support of my husband, my ex-husband, I'll tell you, my husband can tell me something over and over, and I, I don't know if Mark has an insight of me that he will call me, and he'll just like, and I'm just out of the blue, what's going on with you? And he'll give me a pep talk, and it's the exact same thing that my husband said. And my husband said, you just need to hear it from both of us. You know, my ex-mother-in-law, she's very, very religious. And uh, she's going to be 80. But she, she comes over every week and checks on me. And she, we're in her prayers. And she's Catholic. And she's always doing whatever they do at Catholic Church. Or, you know, but I'm not religious. And I tell her I appreciate it because I don't pray. And I'm not going to start just because I lost my son. It's just my belief. That doesn't mean anything. But, you know, it's just... 
yeah, it could have uh, could have destroyed my marriage. But I, my husband's my rock. How has it affected your other son? When I got stronger about a year ago, because he was the strong one and he was representing us for any questions in that. And when I was seeing more and more graphic detail and I basically have to put a wall up because I know I have to go through it. I have to for, for Adam. And I got stronger and I don't know if it just hit Shane that he lost his brother and he let his guard down and he couldn't deal with it and he got weaker. If you were in that same situation again or if there's another mother finds out that her son is being sent to EMDC, what would you say to them? I wouldn't want their child to go there but I wouldn't want anybody's it doesn't matter how old they are when they're your child to go to any jail but the only person that can keep them out is themselves but there's still stuff going on there is that the hardest part mm -hmm. do you think it can happen again yes at EMDC yes why do you say that because they're doing nothing to change the way they run it. So, you know, according to some of the testimony, the inmates run the jail. Well, they have to take that control away from them. They have to be in charge. So that's why I think it could happen again. And maybe you won't get 100% control but you're doing nothing to try and change that by as simple as separating petty thieves from hardened, you know, what are their assaults, you know, like separate. What do you make of the fact that nobody, there are cameras now in place, but nobody's watching the cameras? Yeah. I don't know what they're doing. I don't. Did that surprise you? Um, yes, I guess. I, I hadn't really thought about it until seeing that somebody, you know, begging for their life and nothing's being done. Mm -hmm. So why would it, why why have them? There were some guards who were criminally charged, but uh, that didn't proceed because they argued that they didn't get a speedy trial and the judge at this point has agreed that um, that that's a valid argument this the case against the guards started like almost three years ago this 11b law came into effect in the summer I don't think that I should have been allowed to argue that their case was already in progress because had that not made the precedent 11b now you've got hundreds of cases lawyers or crowns trying to scrunch time in mm -hmm. had the crown known they wouldn't have agreed to all the for the preliminary trials for the guards, it was over five dates over five months because the two, they were tried together, the two lawyers, their schedules conflicted. So had you know, had the Crown known this 11B could be used against them, they would have said, well, that's not our problem. We only have two years. Send an associate. But the Crown agreed. Okay, well, you both want to be here? Well, that date will do. That date will do. Hmm. So now you don't have Crowns doing that. Well, I, may, I shouldn't state that. Right. But I believe 
anything that was already in the process should not uh, be allowed to use this 11B law. I was reading the, um, the decision by the arbiter and it struck me as really powerful and I wanted to just share it with you and wonder what you thought about um, when you read this or hear this. He says, this was the most difficult case I've had to undertake as an arbiter. Indeed, the most difficult case I've been associated with in my 35 years in labor relations. My thoughts throughout the hearing and as I was writing this decision often came back to the victim as well as his family and his friends, although I do not know any of them. It was painful for me, even as someone removed from these events, to learn how Adam died. I have thought often how painful it must be for those who knew and were close to him, who are now burdened with the knowledge of the way he lost his life. It's very, very respectful. It's very nice. No, I didn't hear that. I didn't see that part. I haven't seen that. But, yeah. It's nice that he's being acknowledged as a person, whereas he wasn't treated like a person at EMDC and and it's not just him he's not alone in that but what do you think I mean this guy says he's been doing this kind of work and this the facts of this case are some of the most difficult he's dealt with in 35 years of his career how do you process that as a mother I probably won't until the verdict guilty and then I'm not sure where my mental state will go uh, to be honest and blunt I just I can't go that deep I need to be strong I need to represent him at his trial and I will go through it and then I'll listen and the other will be videos and photos that are going to imprint my mind forever. But right now I have to, uh, and what I have done is I've just been putting one foot in front of another so that there is justice for Adam. And then I don't know what's going to happen. And I probably have a breakdown. I won't be able to put it on the back shelf anymore. Are you nervous about the trial? Um, I'm not sure if the word is nervous. I have anxiety about it. Mm -hmm. It's going to be six weeks. Um, I'm glad it's going to be finally dealt with. I'm not looking forward to what I'm going to see and hear. And I do hope the jury finds him guilty. I mean, so the bottom line is two men were in that cell and only one man's alive. Nobody else did it but him. Adam's a small framed person. Anthony George is probably twice his size. Adam wouldn't have fought back even if he could have. They can't. So there was no reason for it. And that's basically, I just want to know why. Why would, was it just for fun? Was it just to show the ranger the tough man? I don't know why. If, it, if he wanted both beds and he said, Adam, you sleeping on the floor, Adam would say, yes, sir. 
He'd been beat up in jail. He didn't want to get beat up again. How do you prepare for something like that? How do you prepare to hear the gory details that will likely come up in, during the trial? I can't, I don't, I'm not preparing. How I'm gonna do it, but I, I have to, so it doesn't matter how I do it, I will do it. Do you think Adam would be proud of you? Oh, yes, he always was. He called me Mama Dukes, and he said, I said, and then years and years ago, I said, Why do you call me Mama Dukes? He says, Anybody messes with me, you're gonna duke them. <laughs> I was like, I don't fight. <laughs> But so yeah, it's, all his friends call me that for school. I've been in the mall and I hear, "Hey, Mama Dukes," <laughs> and it's one of his friends. Cause you always looked out for him. All my kids. I don't care what they did in life; they're my pride and joy. Doesn't mean I have to agree with what they did. Loves them. Do you think about Adam now? All the time. What do you think about? Uh, especially on a beautiful sunny day, just him walking down the driveway. You guys need help? Need to let me cut the grass? Hey, let me know when you when you're gonna open the pool, okay, Kenny? I'll help you. He uh have a picture of him. He made, he made, my husband's a uh, Michigan fan, so everything's maize and blue. And uh, he made uh, Kenny a birthday cake. <laughs> and he dyed the cake yellow. And the icing was yellow with blue. Oh, it was. I, <laughs> I didn't want to take a bite of it, but it, it was, you know, he just, he was, just, he was a sweetheart, like, he just, you know, he really uh, got along really good with Kenny. Um, actually, the only Father's Day card Kenny ever got was from Adam, so it sits in the garage beside his stuff. In my living room, his, uh, his urn with his portrait like his that we used at the visitation also um, a really good friend of mine had his portrait done so that hangs on my wall so it doesn't matter which angle you go in you see Adam if you look at the fridge there's uh, there's a, everywhere in my house there's stuff that he bought me like there's a a coaster magnet on my fridge and it says if mothers were flowers I'd pick you first just you know um, I have lots of mom plaques and mementos that are all through my house that are never never getting moved and Adam got you those all of them yeah I have a, a memory card that I'm gonna give to uh, Joe to take all of the pictures from but yeah no he's uh yeah sometimes it was dollar store stuff but man it was the coolest I loved it you know why do you want to share your story and what happened to Adam I want it to make changes I don't want another mother to go through this pain you know we can't, you know, if, if our child ends up in jail, you expect that they're protected. You know, sometimes they're in jail to protect themselves because they're out stealing. Well, that's not good for the community. You know, 
that's not good you know I, you don't steal but when you're on drugs you're not thinking like that you're thinking of how am I gonna get high again but you shouldn't be afraid as a parent to get a collect call from jail and say oh my god is he gonna be okay in there I never, I never thought he wouldn't be okay. I thought when that he, for whatever reason, I don't even know who beat him in Sarnia. I don't know who or why. He wouldn't tell me. Even when I visited, like, you know, I said, okay, your face is almost cleared up. That's good. I, who did this to you? Doesn't matter, Mama. I said, did you owe them drug money? Nope. And he's like, let's not talk about it, Mama. So I don't know. I don't know how the jail system works. If they listen in, I don't know. Mm. But we always just talk general stuff. Mm -hmm. But no, I wouldn't. I never once hung up the phone thinking it was the last time I'd hear from them. I never once opened a letter thinking it was the last letter I was ever getting. And I got both on the same day. My last letter and my last phone call. What are you thinking right now? That as I drive home from here, I, I'm still looking for him. I see somebody about five or six with short dark hair. Always, I'm always double checking. Um, usually, I, as I get closer, I realize that's not his gate. That's not the way you walked. But if I hear something in the driveway, I go look to see if he's coming home. about him and it's good I mean it's good to talk about him and think about him um, that's one something that's been very frustrating is running into people and they basically pretend they don't know you because they don't know what to say to you hmm. and I'm used to that I don't I don't really care I don't want to talk to you anyways <laughs> <laughs> you know Anything else we haven't asked you that you want to share about Adam or about this whole ordeal? Well, I know that the Crown is appealing the guard. And that will be heard in Toronto by a three-panel judge. And I will be attending. And uh, I'm hoping it gets overturned and they have to go to trial. Do you know when that will be? I have not been given a date. Do you think it's before the trial, Anthony George's trial, or after? I have no have, um, victim services doesn't even have an idea. She just informed me that, which is very rare, that they will hear an appeal. Mm -hmm. All three had to agree. So that was, I didn't have my hopes up that it would happen. So it is going to happen, and I'm, I hope, and if, because I think more changes will happen because what I heard and seen in the preliminary trials was sealed by the court, but if they have a trial, it's out in the public and then even more awareness mm -hmm. and then maybe more pressure to make changes. That's all I can hold. I don't, it's not a malicious thing against them as a person. It's about making changes that you do your job. They didn't do their job. That's all. If you were talking to the guards who were there that night, what would you say to them? I would want to know why didn't you help my son? Whether or not it was my son. Why didn't you help 
that person begging for his life. Why? Do your job. Like, why? I want an answer. Why didn't you? And don't pass the buck that, well, management doesn't care, we don't care. Then don't be in that job, in that field. If you could say anything to Adam, what would it be? I just, I love you and I miss you so much. I just want you to come home. That's all. I just, I'm so sorry he went through that pain. I, I just wish, wish he had a chance to prove himself. I just, I don't, that's what hurts the most is that he was in pain in his last breath. Like, can you imagine how afraid he was? And alone? And nobody caring and nobody helping him. Being pummeled. Beaten. I miss him. I love you, Adam. <laughs> I tell him every day anyways. And butterfly flies by him. Hi, Adam. I'm really sorry for your loss. Thank you.